technology, the internet, GPS in the palm of your hand, autonomous operation. Technology is a driver of our times. Since its founding in 1958 in the midst of the Cold War, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, has been a driver of technology. Welcome to Voices from DARPA, a window onto DARPA's core of program managers. Their job? To redefine what is possible. My name is Ivan Amato, and I'm your DARPA host. And today I'm pleased to have with me in the studio Blake Beckstein, a new program manager in DARPA's Biological Technologies Office. He arrived in March of 2016 from the University of Texas at Tyler, and he brings into DARPA a particular love for the entomological kind among us, insects, that is, and he is betting that a combination of insects and genetic techniques can open new pathways to protecting the crops we depend on from both natural and human-perpetrated threats. These are things like droughts and storms, unintentional introduction of invasive species, and the intentional release of plant-harming biological warfare agents, possibly. He just rolled out his first project called Insect Allies, which is challenging the research community to develop plant-protective viruses that insects working as allies with us, can deliver efficiently to threatened plants and bestow protection on them in a single season time frame that can stave off the threat. So thanks, Blake, for coming into the uh, studio and spending some time with me. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So before we talk about the uh, Insect Allies program, let's talk about you, your background, and uh, what brings you to DARPA. Well, I came to DARPA because I saw a fantastic opportunity for my research community uh, the DARPA mission is unlike things that I've done in the past because the DARPA mission is to look at high-risk, high-reward projects that could benefit humanity in uh, sort of that 20 to 50-year time frame. And it also gives an opportunity to de-risk de uh, some programs and some projects uh, so that they can actually come to light and, and see uh, – see use. So when the opportunity to come to DARPA presented itself, I thought it was just this awesome chance to do some really great science. And I was encouraged because I was asked to think about things that traditionally weren't funded very well that I think need so to be So let me done. just stop you for a second because you said when, when the opportunity presented itself. Well, of course, it didn't present itself. Somehow that, <laughs> that happened. Right. You knew somebody or you, you uh, heard about an opportunity, an opening. So how, how did you actually uh, oh, sure. so get in here? Oh, sure. So I was at a meeting. I uh, had moved into an administrative role at the University of Texas at Tyler. And so we have an event uh, every year where we come to D.C. and we get to meet program managers. And, and I actually talked with Jeff Ling, who was the – uh, director of Biological Technologies at the time. And I, I wasn't sure that DARPA really had any interest in agriculture. So, uh, But he was such an interesting person, I wanted to meet and talk to him. So I talked to him uh, after he gave his presentation. And I said, I don't know if we have any overlap in what we're interested in. and uh, But I would love to work with you at some point. And he said, well, actually, we're looking to get into agriculture. you know. And uh, that sort of started this journey of uh, seeing if I fit with the kind of mindset that uh, we have at DARPA, which is, you know, these kind of difficult technologies that need to be developed uh, that could benefit humanity. And, and so it was, a, it was a good fit. Right. And at Tyler, you were a professor of biology, but you also had another hat on, which was the assistant vice president for research uh, and technology transfer, right? So, so those are the two things that, that also go on at DARPA. There are similarities. There's, uh, you know, the people that you work with and you're directing a team to try to um, achieve an objective. And, and so we're, we're definitely doing that. And working in agriculture uh, as a professor, you spend a lot of time where you go out and you think about the technologies that are out there and the, um, you know, genetic-based, molecular-based things that are happening. But you also have to marry that with the reality of situations. When you go to Central America and you walk in a potato field, uh, you start to realize that technology is great, but how do you get that technology to the field? Right, so. so actually get it to the finish line. So we'll talk about exactly. that with uh, the Insect Allies program in just a moment. But there's one more thing I have to ask, and that's because when you read your bio on, uh, on the DARPA website, dar DARPA.mil, the last line is very intriguing. It says that you uh, were on the uh, Discovery Channel's reality TV show called Tethered in 2014. So I just, I just have to hear the story of that. You know, how did that happen? What did you do? And, and did, were, were insects part of that? To start off, I, I'm interested in science education. And so I like the idea of putting a positive spin 
uh, in science, not just the bow tie wearing geeky professor, you know, type person as the scientist, but instead somebody that, uh, you know, kids could aspire to be a good, strong, normal person. And so there was an opportunity that came up to be uh, on a reality show. And the idea was that uh, when you're in a survival situation, people that are alone don't do as well as people that are uh, paired with somebody else or in a group. And so this took it to the next level where I was literally tethered with a six foot uh, cord to another human being. And being that it's reality television, uh, the premise was that I was the scientist and I was actually paired with a shaman. And so we had very different ideas about how the world works. And so through the episode, we had to learn to um, kind of work together and get together on some things. Uh, we actually became very good friends. We survived. I don't want to give the ending away, uh, but I'm sitting here today, so it must have worked out okay. Evidently you did survive, yes. Uh, but I'll tell you that uh, that experience was 100% real. They don't give you food. They don't give you water. So we had to boil all of our water. We had to find the food that uh, could sustain us. And we didn't do really well. I was in Alaska uh, at the end of the summer, so there just wasn't a lot of food around. And um, we ended up uh, at one point, the entomological aspect of this, we ended up finding a dead moose in the middle of a uh, sandbar on a river and uh, decided that I had to have that credibility as an entomologist. So we scooped him out of there, cooked him up, and we ate uh, carcass maggots out of, uh, out of a moose. Mm -mm. Well, okay, that actually might be a nice segue then to talk about uh, your new program, Insect Allies. Those maggots were your allies out there, helped you survive. So talk about uh, the program here at DARPA, what it is, what's the program all about, and what uh, you hope to accomplish with it. So my broad interests are sustaining agricultural uh, capabilities. So as we move forward into the future when we're going to grow our population to 10 billion people in the next 20 to 50 years, how are we going to sustain the food supply? Right. And we're about about 7.3 billion now. So we're talking about in that period of time, another three right. billion or so. And our traditional agricultural approach uh, is great and uh, does, a, does a really good job of sustaining food supply right now. But forward thinking, what are we going to do um, in the future to innovate and, and make things uh, better? And so Insect Allies really comes uh, out of that. It's born out of that where we want to utilize insects to deliver genes into plants that could benefit the plant. Previously, capabilities were only in tissue culture, and that meant that you had to grow up those plants after genetic modification. And then you only find out if the genes do what you want them to do after you've gone through this sort of long, painstaking process. In a world where drought and uh, threats from insects and pathogens are always around, how can we actually protect our plants in the fields where they are? And so this mature plant transformation idea came about, and then uh, that presents a second problem. How do you actually get the genes into the plants where you want them delivered? And so that's where the insect allies come about. Uh, insects, uh, insect vectors in particular, are very good at moving these pieces of genetic material into plants very efficiently and effectively. So why couldn't we use that natural scenario to actually move these genes into plants that give positive characteristics to the plants? So that's what we want to do. We want to use insects to deliver genes into plants that will benefit them. Right now, what are our options in case w uh, crops are threatened somehow by a pathogen or, or some other threat? What, what do we do when that happens? Well, currently what we do is we try to contain the outbreak. And so what that usually means is that we have to destroy the crops that are infected. And, you know, if you don't think too much about the situation, that's just you burn some, you know, cornfields or uh, rogue some trees in, a, in an orchard. Uh, but the, rea the reality is if you ruin that seed source for the next year, you also impact the next year's production and the next year and the next year. And so it's not a small problem to have one of these invasive problems come and then go into a slash and burn mode to, to get rid of the disease. So if we could actually recover those crops very quickly and we could stop those eminent threats, 
then uh, we wouldn't lose production for multiple years. I mean, it almost sounds like a little bit like a, like a medical model. I mean, if I go into to a doctor's office because I'm not feeling well, I might have you know I might get some antibiotics, and in a week I'm feeling better. I mean, in some ways, it sounds a little bit like that because your time frame here is to solve a threat to to make a, a plant you know better in a very short time. Is that on a right? That's, track? That, that's exactly right. And you know, a good example of of where this technology could really benefit would be. Uh, in a tree orchard type situation. In Florida right now, they're dealing with citrus greening. This is a bacterial pathogen that's transmitted by an insect and causes trees to decline uh, rather quickly. And the answer is you need to remove the trees. And if you find outbreaks of the disease, you, you need to get rid of the threat. And so in tree crops, you actually lose those trees for several years because trees take a while to start producing fruit again. So those threats are, are, are very bad. So if you could actually turn on genes that allowed them to survive, uh, that would be a much better situation. Okay. And because we are here at DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, there generally is a, a sort of a national security angle on our projects. So what is that angle here for insect allies? Well, there, it's really twofold. So the first idea is that we want to protect our domestic food supply. So if there was a threat that came in, uh, whether it be environmental, something like drought or uh, flooding, or if it was a pest that was uh, released accidentally or, uh, uh, or on purpose, we'd want to be able to handle that challenge so that we don't destroy our food supply. Because uh, there's a lot of evidence that shows that uh, unstable food supply leads to unstable culture, and we definitely don't want that to happen. So that kind of leads to the second part, which is international uh, food safety. In unstable regions in the world, food stability, water stability are things that lead to even less stable conditions. So if we can have a hand at the beginning of that problem and provide sustainable food uh, to these populations, then I think that, that that definitely is a national security concern, and that's something that we have the ability to address now. Okay, let's dive in just for a little while on, on the actual biotechnology that you're, you're pushing, because there's several components uh, to it. We've got, we've got the insect allies, but they're, they're going to be the ones that are going to deliver, in a sense, the, the, the threat-reducing agent. Uh, a virus that you're going to maybe talk to us a little bit about and then what, what you hope the end result might be out there in the field. So, so talk about the components of insect allies and, and uh, how you're going to maybe move the, the state of the art forward. Yeah, so it's broken up into really three areas, the virus. So taking a virus and, and a lot of people think of viruses only in a bad context, but in reality, viruses uh, can be benign. They might move genetic material around and you know, non-dangerous ways. And so what we want to do is we want to identify viruses that uh, have very limited negative effects on, on any host and then remove any possibility of negative outcomes from them and use those as our shuttles to get genetic material placed into the plant's genome. And so we're going to use insects, which are uh, very good uh, movers of viruses. If you select the right virus and you select the right insect, uh, it can be a very specific relationship. So uh, we also have the opportunity to safeguard. And just when you say specific, you mean if, if there's a certain plant that is threatened, it will go to those plants specifically. And if there's 10, 20 other species around, hopefully it would, they would ignore those. There are generalists that will feed from a lot of different host plants. Those aren't the insects that we would select in this program. Rather, we want to select insects that have a very specific relationship with maybe a single species of plant. So if used in this way, they're not going to go feed on everything that's out there. So it's a very specific relationship. Okay, maybe to make this concrete, can you imagine a you know, potential scenario, a specific crop that has a specific threat uh, on it, and then what kind of virus you might devise to treat it and how you would get that into an insect and potentially mitigate the threat? Oh, I can think of a lot of ideas. Uh, <laughs> uh, give us but, one. Uh, well, but I think what we want to do is ask our uh, our performer community. We want to go out and ask the research community, what are these major threats? What specific relationships do they see that can be utilized in this way? And so this is a very open program, and we're going to ask uh, the research community, academics, uh, to come to us and tell us what problems need to be addressed and what are the players. 
Okay, so rather than specifying at this point, you want to keep this open, and, and, and that way you maximize sort of the creative uh, potential of your performer base, the research base. Right. I, I know so many people out there in academia that, are, that have great ideas, so I want to give them a chance to come in and tell us what they need to address okay. and how to do now, it. Now, we can speak a little bit generally, though, about some of the molecular tools, because I think probably what one of the things that gives you such strength in moving forward with what really is an ambitious program is because we've, we've really been seeing some new, remarkable kinds of uh, molecular uh, tools. Maybe you can just talk about one or two of those to give uh, our listeners a sense of, of what's becoming possible. Sure. The revolution in molecular biology has been based around the 2012 finding of CRISPR-Cas9 and new utilization of that tool. And just briefly, I know that that's a mouthful, one sentence or two about what that sort of does. So CRISPR-Cas9 is a molecular tool that allows you to edit the genome of a host, and it does it in a very specific way so that Cuts in the genome are based on a couple of letters, so it's very specific where it will go. So uh, traditionally, when you've done genetic modification, you end up kind of putting it into the genome and hoping that it goes to the right place. Uh, these new tools allow us to be very specific in, in where it's placed, so it doesn't interrupt genes that uh, are needed. Okay, and so so that means that that there's all kinds of threats out there. If we know something about the genetic basis of those, then we can use a tool like CRISPR-Cas9, go in very specifically, and maybe do a kind of genetic fix, and that can happen in in, in a single season, and thereby that might be the the approach for a, a new way of protecting our food supply. Right. A lot of these uh, gene cassettes that we would use to solve these problems are um, already being looked at. And uh, a good example would be flood-resistant rice uh, that's, uh, that's out there. A suite of genes is known. And that's which, what you meant by gene cassette, a suite of genes. Right, a yeah. suite of genes mm -hmm. that would allow it to survive in difficult situations. There's the same type of technology that's being found for high salinity, uh, drought resistance, drought tolerance. And so if we could actually figure out a way to put those genes into the crops that we're interested in, uh, then we could get through those bad situations all right. So this this sounds like a great idea. We're going, you know, our population keeps going up. Maybe we're going to reach 10 billion. We're going to want, uh, you know, abundant and safe food supplies. So this sounds like a great thing to do. Uh, but this is just only one way you uh, are interested in the human-insect relationship. But you have some other ideas, I think, about how uh, our partnership with insects might uh, expand. Maybe you can talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. So I've also been interested in alternative protein sourcing. Um, and so I have a, a program in the SBIR program. And that SBIR, that, that's uh, where we work business. with small businesses. Correct. Mm -hmm. And um, we're actually looking at uh, delivering high protein sources from insects, but also uh, using technology to improve our ability to do that. So one side of it might be to uh, use technology to manage pest and pathogen problems in insect colony rearing. So could we shut down viral infections in these colonies that usually cause insect uh, collapse? So are we talking about the, the bee collapse uh, issue, for Similar, example? Right. And there, there's a, a whole host of uh, viruses that cause that same problem in other insect species. And so in crickets, for example, which are probably one of the most popular uh, edible insect uh, producers out there, there's a similar virus that causes collapse of their colonies. So if you were one of the uh, companies that was doing this, uh, an invasion of the virus might cause a complete collapse of all of your um, livestock, <laughs> small your, livestock. Your entomological livestock. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, and then we can go the other direction and actually utilize these insects to also deliver uh, needed nutrients like vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin D, a uh, whole host of, of different ideas. There, there's, there's really no lack in ideas of what it could produce, but we could actually develop insect, uh, edible insects into a realm where not only can they feed a nation, but they can also deliver uh, additional resources. Now, have you already practiced what you seem to be preaching here, which is to say that insects might become part of the pantry? So have you eaten Oh, absolutely. Insects? You do. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it's funny. I, I realize that people have an aversion to this. I, there's an aversion to this in my own family. And so I understand it very well. However, 80 percent of the world eats insects as a stable protein source. And so, uh, you know, in the Western world, we're kind of an oddity where we don't utilize this, uh, this opportunity. So, again, you know, there's great sources of protein right now. 
that everybody enjoys if you like steak, if you like chicken, if you like all these other things. But again, when we get to a point where our population continues to rise, uh, we're going to need to have alternative sources. So we're really thinking into the future of, of where this could. Fit. So I'm now, I'm now remembering that the early on in the conversation, you did mention on on the show tethered that that you found those they were, were maggots. They were uh, maggots in, in the moose. So among the various insects that you've tried, somehow I imagine you've tried crickets. <laughs> where where do they stand? Were maggots great? Uh, were they not as good as uh, something else you've tried? You know, honestly, the maggots were relatively tasteless. But I cooked them with a little bit of different. Locally sourced Alaskan fireweed, uh, so they were delicious. They they actually took on the flavor of uh, what you cooked them with. So Blake, is there a, a question that I should have asked you that I didn't, or just uh, that you wish I had? And if so, you can even ask it and answer it. We well, should have asked me why I'm interested in insects at all. Love that question. And the answer is I haven't always been. Uh, I didn't grow up as a child wanting to be an entomologist. I didn't have insect collections. But rather, I was interested in the world in general and how things worked. And so that drew me to biology when I was a college student. And through my college classes, I was at the University of Northern Iowa. I randomly took an entomology class. And it opened up this idea that we could ask these biological questions and we could use insects to answer them. And they're living organisms. They are abundant. And then I also realized that uh, going into my career in, as an academic that we're always going to need to eat. And so funding for agriculture is always going to be around. And so it was a good way to actually marry some of the ideas that I had of asking questions about the world um, and then also working in a field that's super important because you know food security is going to be a, a a big problem going forward. So I ended up as an entomologist out of, hey, this is a great way to ask the questions that I want to answer. So one of the things that fascinates me here at DARPA and having the opportunity to uh, get to know a lot of different technologies uh, in the making, potential technologies, is that uh, you know, th- these are technologies that have the potential to do a lot of good, but they're, they're also uh, bringing in capabilities that could be used for nefarious reasons. So in the case here of, uh, of developing new kinds of ways of get- getting genetic material into living things, in this case plants, that sounds like a great thing when it comes to, to crop protection, but it also sounds to me like it could open open doors to new kinds of, say, biological warfare. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that there are uh, potential negatives that could uh, come out of technology being developed like this. But I think the overwhelming uh, thought is that this is a positive technology. Uh, There's much easier ways to cause large agricultural damage in regions um, that certainly wouldn't have to tackle this level of sophistication. And so uh, th- there's there's definitely much more benefit than risk. Right. I mean, to actually sort of go down deep into the into the molecular machinery uh, is is probably a, a lot harder than what just going in and spraying chemicals or something. Spraying you know, chemicals or identifying viruses or pests that you know aren't in the region that you could bring in and release and that kind of thing. And and so really that's what we want to guard against. There is the potential that technology like this could be used for nefarious purposes, but you know, the positive that can come out of this and the world-changing uh, abilities that we're going to gain is is incredible. I just want to thank you, Blake, for this great conversation. I've learned a lot. And thanks for, for spending the, this time with me. Well, thanks for having me. This is uh, very exciting. And thanks, listeners, for sharing this time with us. I hope you join us again for the next Voices from DARPA. For more information about Blake, his programs, and the other breakthrough technologies DARPA is working on, visit darpa.mil. And for links to allow you to download this podcast, go to the Voices from DARPA page on DARPA's website. 